welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we return to the Psychiana Lessons and Lesson 13. So far we've slowly unveiled an understanding and the immensity and power of the vast God Law. Today, he goes into the story of Jesus, talking about the power of Jesus and how he utilized the same God Law and how you too have the same power that Jesus did. Advanced Course Number 1, Lesson 13 Dear Friend and Student, I promised you that in this lesson we should deal with the Carpenter Man of Galilee, not from any religious angle in the accepted sense of the word, however, nor shall we deal with him as any God-man at all. All our dealings with this wonderful character will be from the standpoint that he never was more than a human being, even as you and I. There are many, though, who believe him to be a one-third of the Trinity. Although, why they believe it, they cannot tell. They have never spent the time or given the effort to find out just what is known about that phase of his existence and what is not known. If they did, they would instantly realize that if they chose to call him a god and look upon him as such, it will have to be through a strained sense of faith, for certainly there is no evidence in existence which would tend to justify the statement that he ever was other than a man. Personally, I am willing to believe anything that can be proven, but I am not willing to prove anything that cannot be proven, especially along religious lines, for I know the history of most of the systems of religion, and I know that there is no more proof of the divinity of the gods than there is that the moon is made of green cheese. Also, you will find, if you care to investigate, that these differing systems of religion sprang into existence long after their respective gods were dead and buried, if indeed they ever lived at all. For instance, there was no such religion as Christianity when Christ was on earth. It was unknown. It sprang into existence far later, and still we have it with us. It's not very potent today, however, for men and women in the first place are not believing the story. In the second place, when they force themselves to believe it, they find that its claims cannot be borne out and its precepts do not work, so they are discarding it. I think perhaps it may be wise here to just submit a few facts regarding the infancy and birth of this Galilean carpenter to make my point. Forever so often some dignitary of the church attempts to take me to task for my stand on religion, as Billy Sunday did recently. They don't get very far with me, however, but they might with someone less familiar with church history than I am. I shall just call passing attention to a few pertinent facts, which will stop any argument not based on faith, and then we shall get down to the real significance of this man, for there is a marvelous significance to him, to be sure. The message he came to preach went a thousand miles over the heads of the religionists of his day, and for that matter, is still a thousand miles over the heads of orthodox religionists of today. We shall look into that later in the lesson, though. The first thing I want to call your attention to is the fact that the time and the place of his birth were never historically known. The time is placed anywhere inside of 15 years and is credited to almost every day of that 15 years. If it be a fact that he was a one-third of the master intelligence overruling this great creation, then it certainly would be known just where and when and in what year and what month and what week and what day he was born. But history knows nothing about that, either church or profane history. Then again, another mighty significant fact is that practically all of the rest of the world's crucified saviors were born on December the 25th. Moreover, most of them were saved from destruction in infancy. Their births were all miraculously foretold and in many cases, the sun became dark, etc. Astronomy gives us no record of these happenings in the stellar regions, but religious tradition has lots to say about it, and every supernaturally born god the world has ever had was born under circumstances similar to those under which Christ was born. Therefore, if Christ were a god, so were the rest of the old Grecian gods. All could do what is claimed for Christ, even to raising the dead and walking on the water. Their mothers were usually holy virgins, and Plato's mother was conceived by God. Pythagoras was a spirit in heaven before he was born on earth, and his birth was miraculously foretold. 
He, like the Christ, restored sight to the blind. He cast out devils. He walked on the sea. He healed all manner of diseases and handled poisonous snakes with impunity. He read the thoughts of others and discerned them. He could foretell the future and do thousands of other wonderful things. To be precise here, let me say to you, there is nothing that can be said in favor of Christ's miraculous birth and resurrection that cannot also be said in favor of a dozen other world saviors also. Not alone is there no record whatsoever in history of such a character. But neither has there ever been of many of the other gods this world has been blessed or cursed with. As a matter of fact, there is far more evidence that Plato lived than there is that Christ lived. However, I'm not questioning his birth at all. For history gives us enough indirect evidence that a person called Jesus Christ probably lived on earth. Where I differ with supernaturally revealed religion is on the point of his immaculate birth, his resurrection, and other impossible things attributed to him. Those who gave us these pagan yarns little knew the harm they were doing to humanity when they gave them. For if the Bible story of this man Jesus is true, then it very effectively removes him from us. If he had a miraculous birth, and if he were the supreme God in human form, then you and I, being but mortals, cannot ever hope to duplicate the life he lived. For he was God, and you and I are human beings, born in the exact same manner as the rest of the human race. But if Jesus Christ were only a man, then it places him immediately within our reach, and you and I can also do the things through the same power he used, which things he did. There can be no question about that. I shall not touch here the things he did and the things attributed to him that he did not do. The point I want to make is that if he were God, then by no means can you or I ever attain the heights to which he is supposed to have attained. Unless, of course, we are all gods. And there is a lot of truth in that statement. For I believe that we are the same identical physical and mental structure that Jesus was. If he were a god, so are you. But we shall not halt long here, for I want to draw in this lesson the picture of this Galilean carpenter as I believe it to exist. And by the way, thinkers the world over are very rapidly coming to this viewpoint of this man, Jesus Christ. The personality of Jesus Christ is a very interesting one, and also one which is very revolutionary too. To me, this man Jesus is about the sweetest character that has ever lived. The pages of history have been graced by many unusual and sweet characters, it is really a pity that history's pages are absolutely silent on this man Jesus. In church histories, of course, there is to be found much reference to him. In fact, they are built around him. But I am here talking about authentic, recognized histories of that land and age. And this message of history is complete and absolute silence regarding this man who was God, as the church would have us believe. Personally, I believe he lived, and from that premise I shall write from now on. Many years did I spend studying that character, and many, many hours have I spent just quietly reading of him. I've realized, of course, that the writings concerning him vis-a-vis -vis the four Gospels are absolutely anonymous writings. No one knows who wrote them, or has there ever been known to exist a single original manuscript covering the story of this carpenter of Galilee. So in many studies of him, and in this present writing about him, I shall ask you to remember that I am writing about him as I have pictured him. And even though there is nothing much authentic about him to be discovered, I might do the same thing about Confucius or Krishna. And incidentally, one might do far worse than make the philosophy of Confucius his philosophy of life. For there are to be found some of the most profound spiritual truths in the teachings of Confucius. As in fact, there are also to be found many spiritual truths in every system of so-called supernatural religion. This but proves the truth of my contention that the God law operates outside of all varying creeds and denominations, and probably in spite of a good many of them. However, believe it or not, I have learned to love this Galilean character, and if I am wrong, and if the future should prove that he was God, then no harm will have been done, for I repeat, I have learned to love that man, not on account of his presumed godship, but on account of his natural understanding of the spiritual God law. With all his strength of character, there is intermingled a sweetness almost inexplicable. And you must believe me when I say to you now that my intensely human and faltering heart thrills a little bit at the prospect of writing a lesson on this master of spiritual things. 
for he was a master. Make no mistake about that. What a pity it is that well-meaning but uneducated religionists and religious promoters attempted to spoil this wonderful character by making him divine. For in so doing, they robbed mankind of a possibility that it has never had offered to its sense. For when one begins to know this man, there invariably starts a friendship that lasts through time and perhaps eternity. And so I may confess to you that this much misunderstood carpenter man and myself have become pals, as it were. I learned a lot of spiritual truth from that man. Sometimes, in the stress of a very busy life, I weaken just a little, or rather, I feel that perhaps I might weaken in such moments as those. However, I remember his superb strength in the face of all obstacles, and revivified with the power this man of Galilee knew so well. The weakness is always turned into overwhelming strength. And once more, I am vindicated in my claim that the greatest power in this world today is the power of the living God law. And if it should be that this life does not end it all, and if it should further be proven that we live again on the other side, then that fact will be to me the very sweetest fact I know for the friendship I have formed with the carpenter pal then be carried over yonder, and the day will come in which I shall see that face of ineffable sweetness. Beloved, there is one enemy yet to be destroyed, and that enemy is death. This last lone enemy will be destroyed just as soon as the truth of the living God Spirit is made known. It will not be through any judgment bar or anything on that order, but it will be through a full knowledge, here and now, of the mighty power my friend, the Galilean carpenter, knew and used. And the friendship I have formed here for this man will be a different sort of friendship when this last enemy is destroyed. I can say that to you with assurance that friendship will continue throughout the myriads of ages when there shall be no more time and when you and I are once more restored through understanding of the present God law to that state of existence we had a way back yonder prior to the time the first doubt of God entered the picture. What a pity that it ever did enter, but it did. And you and I have discovered to our sorrow that it did not pay to doubt the spoken word of the mighty life spirit or God, and had that two back yonder known what the awful consequences would have been as you and I know what they are. They would have thought a second time before believing any outside suggester as they did. It is just as disastrous to doubt the same life spirit now as it was then. And I trust that before this course is finished, my students will have learned the utter foolishness of ever again doubting the great presence whose power is so unmistakable right here and now. But the lesson had to be learned, and so it is that you and I were plunged through the act of another into a world as different as night from day from the first creation of it. However, in passing, may I say to my students that they may depend upon it that at the right time, in the right manner, the state existence will be restored once more. And it may be that a far more radiant state of existence than what was will be manifested. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that this mighty life spirit hath prepared for those that love or know him, for to know him is to love him. People sometimes ask me if I believe that we shall know each other in heaven. You will never be in heaven as it is generally understood today, my friend. The heaven that God created is the entire space outside of this earth. The stars are in heaven. The planets are in heaven. And in the sense that God is everywhere, then He is in heaven, but in no other sense. He's not in some place where there is any physical existence of any sort. Neither is He preparing a place for us if by that we mean any residence for us as we are manifesting here in the flesh. What the future may bring forth we do not know. But you may be sure that when the fullness of the spiritual power of the mighty life spirit is fully known, there will be not of so-called sin in the world, not of poverty, not of suffering, not of disease. There will be a perfection that the world today knows nothing of. The ideals of Confucius will never bring this to pass nor will the ideals of Krishna, Vishnu, or Christ, or any other personality. For there are as many different interpretations put on his teachings as there are ministers almost. What will bring this about will be the actual knowledge and presence of the power of the living spirit, here and now. Ideals cannot do it. If they could do 
this old world would have been straightened out a long time ago, but it's far from being straightened out at the present time, I can tell you. True it is that I believe the whole universe is on the verge of the greatest spiritual upheaval and demonstration it has ever witnessed. But today, is it in this dark period just before the dawn, I should not be in the slightest degree surprised to see mankind bathed in blood such as never before had it been. I hope not. I trust I am wrong. But there is abroad in the world a spirit, or rather a disregard for the spirit of the living creative God law. And this is becoming quite pronounced. Men and women are not quite ready yet to accept the spirit of truth. They will be some day and soon, I hope, but they are not there yet. Those of us, however, who are trying to know something of this mighty spiritual God law know, and we know full well that the life spirit of God exists here and now and is gloriously more than sufficient for our every need, no matter what that need may be. It remains still for the world at large to know the existence of this power, and I am today the happiest man alive on account of the part I am playing in sending all around the civilized world the mighty truths of God. I can tell you that it's a responsibility, but it's a joy. I receive criticism and lots of it, but that is only natural and is always the case when one begins to upset ancient traditions and religious doctrines, and it makes no difference whether the new truth overshadows them with power or not. The hard-shelled religionists don't want it. A few years ago, I heard of a preacher in Portland, Oregon, who made the statement from the pulpit, there was no question at all that the scientists and psychologists knew far more of God than the church knows, but he said, we have built this church organization ourselves. It is exactly as we want it, and we will not change it even though the other fellows has more of the truths of God than we have. It is mighty easy to find the reason this brother is preaching, isn't it? But to come back to the carpenter of Galilee, my friend, my true friend, the friend who would love me were he on the earth and the friend I love even though I have never seen him, or had it not been for the spiritual insight into the God realm which he had, things might have been different in my life. Was it not he who first preached the message of the actual living presence of this mighty God power? Was it not? He who first brought the story of this earth? And was it not the same story in the story alone which made it possible for me to know the actual presence, the living, marvelous presence of this mighty God law we are here learning about? None other was qualified to make such a revelation as he was, and had not that revelation been made, I should never have been able to learn the way, and neither would you, for that matter, or anyone else. And as I look back this evening over the years to the time when that boyhood heart of mine was touched by the story of his rejection, I wonder had I known then the roughness of the trail ahead of me, whether I should have attempted to tread it or not. Had I known the sharp, jagged edges against which I would tear myself, had I known the loneliness of the night spent in wrestling with God, had I known the almost impenetrable blackness which was to confront me for years. Had I known all this, I very much question whether or not I should have gone on or thrown up a sponge and denied the very existence of God at all. You may depend upon one fact, however, and that is this. The man through whom God chooses to make a revelation to this earth will be a man who is willing to believe and trust even though he go to his death doing so. Through no other sort of man can any revelation from God ever come. History has proven that time and time again, and had it not been for that carpenter pal of mine, I should never have been able to come through at all. But he charmed me, he drew me, his story rang true, and it made no difference to me if the church crucified him. I believed both in him and in the remarkable story he came to tell. And as always in the realm of God, the belief itself was the answer. I wish I could put that more plainly, but I cannot. It is an immutable law of the living God himself. In fact, it is the God law that according to your faith, be it unto you. And being absolutely, unalterably immutable, in essence, the believing prayer or desire for prayer is only another name for desire. You may believe me when I say to you that it is utterly impossible for you to desire or pray for anything without receiving it from the living God law, if you believe in its presence. I very much question 
if there are 15 ministers in the entire world who actually believe the truths as Jesus taught them and spake them. By truths I mean the words he said, as he said them, and without any other interpretation on them other than what he put on them. I doubt very much there is a single solitary minister in the entire universe who is willing to take the words of Christ literally, exactly as he spake them, and risk either his neck or his job upon these words. And so it is that I have come to love this man of Galilee far better than I love my life. And the very exercises I am prescribing you and asking you to follow are the self-same exercises that have brought to me what little faith in God that I may have. And in the final summing up, had I been able to literally believe the words of a carpenter friend of mine long ago, I would have done so. In a sort of mental hazy way, I believed that he was not, but as far as believing in him goes, well, I just couldn't do it. It wasn't in me. I believed that it was possible to rely absolutely on this God, but how to do it, I knew not. Little did I suspect that this dynamic power was all around me, a mighty, immutable, unchangeable law operating for my benefit and charged and supercharged with power that could be contacted by me. I know it now, however, and am passing the knowledge I have obtained on to you. I shall not hold out to you any false hopes that overnight you will be able to come into full realization of the actual presence of the living God, although that is perfectly possible, and had you the faith necessary, you could do that very thing. But the chances are that you will have to grow slowly, as I did. Have you ever seen a beautiful lily blooming on the hillside? Sure you have. Well, one of the Bible writers called attention to that lily and asked us to consider how it grew. Shall I tell you how it grows? Well, it grows by just staying there and making no effort, at least no physical effort, to grow. That's all. It's quietly absorbing moisture and food from the earth as it absorbs the growth takes care of itself. If it made any attempt to grow, it would spoil itself. So it will be with you. The truth about the living God will gradually unfold itself to you. And when once it unfolds, you will never lose it. And remember this the more anxious you are to know the power of this mighty life spirit, the faster will it unfold itself to you. Soon you will come to the place where you will not need me or anyone else to show you the way. It will unfold itself automatically from the living God himself. Then it will be when you shall be perfect master over all your material surroundings, and you will know how to supply your every need, and your progress from then on will be in your own hands. All I can do is to show you the way to begin and to show you how to actually get in touch with this great living God of ours. How far you go with him is in your own hands. The exercises given to you are to train you to do that very thing. We've been steeped in unbelief and superstition so long that our very nature has become impregnated with it. And in this day and age, we cannot mention God without putting on a long face or shrinking into the background. God's name ought to be the most talked of thing in the world, but it isn't. The mighty living life spirit ought to be on every tongue, but it isn't. Only on Wednesday night and on Sunday is it proper to talk about him, and then we let one man do all the talking and pay him for doing it, and all he gives us is pagan superstition and dark age beliefs. Now mark me well, please. The only way to get that rotten unbelief and superstition out is to practice actual exercises in faith and belief. For instance, if I can make you believe that your affirmation concerning the power of the living God is true, then step by step can I make you believe in the actual presence of the living God himself. You may see now why I am so insistent that you constantly repeat the statements and affirmations. If I can make you believe in the power of this great living spirit, then I can make you believe in the great spirit itself. Don't you see? I am doing in these exercises and in this course of study by scientific means what the religious leaders of the country have vainly attempted to do by just simply telling you or asking you to believe. That method is wrong. We've had it preached to us so long now that a great majority of those preaching it do not believe it themselves. Now, if I can step by step intelligently show you who and what this wonderful living God actually is, and if I can step by step give you exercises that I myself have actually proven will manifest the actual presence and power of this great living God in your everyday life, then I have accomplished what the church has utterly failed to accomplish. 
I have brought into being by intelligent interpretation and understanding of facts as revealed not only to me, but to the entire race if they chose to believe them, faith in the living God. And the end more than justifies the means. I have made the statement once to you that blind belief is unscientific and to ask a man to believe something that his intelligence cannot grasp is to ask that man to do the impossible. I speak now as a psychologist. The trouble with religion today is that it has taken the plain unvarnished facts of God as Jesus spake them and as they exist and as they ever existed and has clothed them in superstition to such an extent that Christ himself or God himself could never recognize them. Thank God, though a remnant have remained, which remnant we're unwilling to continue the sham of churchism, and this remnant have made up their minds to know the truth of the God of the universe, or else explode the whole theory. And what did we find? Well, we found that there is in existence a living life spirit, which can and will in the moment we can trust it to fully supply our every need and now on this earth. It makes no difference that we may need. It makes no difference what the trouble may be, whether the lack of health, lack of happiness, or lack of success. The living God law can supply it, and can supply it here and now. This man Jesus knew the secret of it all. Before the spiritual God law, as he knew and used it, seeming miracles were done. But they were not miracles at all. They were the perfectly natural things for him to do. What was thought to be supernatural laws, but divinely natural law, and that is the lesson the world has yet to learn. It made no difference to this carpenter man what was needed. The spiritual God law supplied the need. Shall I tell you the secret of the power of the lonely Nazarene? Listen for a moment and digest it well. It will open up to you like a rose when you see it. This Nazarene knew the existence of the mighty life spirit I am talking to you about and he knew how to keep himself in tune with this mighty law. And so may you, for I shall tell you a little secret now. It is perfect harmony with the God law that brings complete victory over every material circumstance. The existence of the great cosmic world filled with its cosmic energy or ray is an established fact. It is also an established fact that your thoughts are things. It is also well known to you now that your thoughts are a part of the great spiritual cosmic realm. I have been very careful to explain to you how this thought realm of yours was part of the great cosmic consciousness or energy. I have told you to continually and without lapse direct your desires right straight into this realm of cosmic or God energy. You've done carefully the things I've asked you to do and by judging by the letters, I daily receive, the great proportion of my students have found that this great cosmic or God consciousness really exists and really does the things needed to be done. And may I say to you that the more of the cosmic consciousness you absorb, the more spiritual and happier will you become. Your work from now on is but to keep yourself in harmony with the great cosmic God law or realm as it exists. This is to be done by utter relaxation at night and by constant recognition of the power of this cosmic God realm by you. I think you'll be able to see now the reasonableness of my hypothesis, and now I want you to go quite a little farther in your simple little but dynamic exercises. I want you to practice being very quiet and tuning yourself to the great cosmic consciousness. You can do this through the channel of your thoughts. At night, just say from a thankful heart the affirmation I gave you in the last lesson. I thank thee, Father, that thou hast heard me. And then stay quiet for a long time or until you go to sleep, keeping your thoughts far out yonder into the realm of the God consciousness. Let the invisible emanations from this realm flow through and through you and realize at all times that you are now using the very creative power of the earth and the heavens in your life. If you place a piece of steel against a magnet and rub the two together, after a few rubs, a piece of unmagnetized steel will become magnetized, and when you place yourself up against the God consciousness, then you will absorb the power of the great God law, and your life will be transformed from then on. The religious people would have us get down on our knees and pray to some mystical creature in heaven called God, and then only if it be his sweet will, in his own good time, they will receive the petitions but they never do. 
how much better is it to know that God is a real living spiritual power capable of charging others with that power how much better is it than praying to actually place yourself in vital living contact with the all creating living life spirit here and now it is an old saying and incidentally a well-known fact that as one's thoughts are so is one this is especially true in the god realm when once you begin to realize the fact that god is a living reality to you and a living law capable of fulfilling your every need then what a power there is for you to use is there not while well, my friend all the god power of the whole creation lies in your hands and the closer you get to it and keep to it the more powerful will you be you can see that you know this power exists you know it exists for you all right and just from now on absorb or take from the god realm the power it so freely offers you in your business or in your home it makes no difference which you use the mighty power of this mighty god law moment by moment i want you to saturate yourself with it that it will bubble out of you and everything you touch will be a success is there a disharmony in your home there will not be if you are filled with the spirit of the god law is there a failure in business there will not be when you become so filled with the wisdom and business acumen of the god law that failure cannot manifest at all send your thoughts into the great cosmic realm draw from that realm the things of god that you need or the material things for that matter and when you have isolated yourself and your thought to god or to this great cosmic god consciousness the things you need to manifest will manifest perhaps not tomorrow but they will manifest and the things needed to be done to bring that manifestation will come to you i think you can see this so until you receive your next lesson do as i ask you to get so close to this god realm and keep so close to it that you become full of its power this is the way in which jesus obtained his power you will remember that he loved to be alone either on the mountain side or by the sea and i can tell you what his thoughts were on these occasions they were thoughts of the power of what he called his father this was only another way of saying the power of god and this is but another way of saying the great cosmic creative intelligence behind the universe points to remember in this lesson one jesus obtained his power from close communion with the great life spirit of the universe two he learned the secret of being alone with God or with the great God consciousness of the universe. Three, you may have the very same power that Jesus had when you will become so close to this cosmic power that you become like it. Four, let your evening exercises and your waking exercises be designed to rest quietly and let the God consciousness thrill you and flow through you to the very full. If you should experience strange vibrations, write and let me know immediately many students will experience them and many will not if you do have her i want to know of it at once also if you see different colors before your vision when you are contacting the spiritual realm i want to know that also examination questions for lesson number 13. these examination questions are for your benefit and you should know the answers to them all if they are not clear to you read your lesson again and again until they are clear one from what standpoint is the character of Jesus considered in this lesson? 2. How can this standpoint be justified? 3. Mention some of the facts that throw doubt upon the Bible story of the miraculous birth of Jesus. 4. If the Bible story were true, humanity would be the sufferer. Why? 5. What answer is given to the inquiry? Shall we know each other in heaven? 6. If just one condition be fulfilled, it will be utterly impossible for you to desire anything without receiving it from the living God law. 7. How will it be enabled to come into full realization of the actual presence of the living God? 8. In what way can you get rid of unbelief and superstition? 9. What is it that brings complete victory over every material circumstance? 10. By what means are you enabled to keep yourself in harmony with the great cosmic God realm? 11. What instructions are given you for nighttime? 12. How did Jesus obtain this wonderful power? And that concludes lesson 13 of the Psycheana lessons. This one in particular 
is talking about something I've always agreed with. To believe that Jesus is the only God and that he is exclusively of God and that no one else is has always been the moment you read the story. Well, it means that you're nothing. Jesus was this Messiah and you are nothing. And that was not the intention of the story. He is talking about the I am. He is claiming his godhood and his sonhood or whatever you want to call it in relation to everyone else. As he says in his trial, are ye not gods? He definitely states in the Bible that you are God. And he says, and he does say that you can do what he does and even more. This was never a story about one individual that had this great power that we will never have. And if you can suspend your belief in that idea, because that is limiting you, if you believe that only Jesus had this power, then move along. But understand that maybe you don't have these powers because you believe that only Jesus had that power. As Neville Goddard says, there's no proof that he even existed. But these powers are real. And I believe that we all awaken this Christ within us. And that Christ within us is this God law in action. Let me know how it's been going so far with your affirmations. If you have had anything like he is talking about, if you've seen colors or vibrations in your connection to the living God law, let me know. Put it in the comments. I want to know. This law is powerful and these lessons are timeless. So I'd love to get your impressions of this. And I'm not sure how much longer we'll go with the Psycheana. I may do a super episode where I conclude all of them at once. As we do these lessons, less people watch them just because it says lesson number on it. It's unfortunate. If I just said Frank B. Robinson and put the titles on it, I think more people would watch. But people think that, oh, I got to go back and watch the first lesson. It's not true. These are all unique in themselves and you can use these exercises at any point you can listen to any of the lessons but i'd like to get your impressions so far if you want me to continue in any case all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution